Hello, you're watching Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson. Now, what a few days it has been for Europe. Leaders of the EU's 28 member states came together in the historic Austrian city of Salzburg, not for a fun spin on the Sound of Music tour, but to discuss some of the most pressing concerns for the bloc today, namely security, migration and Brexit. Well, the meeting organised by Austria, as it currently holds the rotating presidency of the European Union. And I am very pleased to welcome from Vienna the Austrian government's spokesman, Peter Lansky Tiefenthal. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'd like to begin uh, in Salzburg with the summit. Uh, there were congratulations for the Austrian government from the likes of Donald Tusk, Jean-Claude Juncker, but it was much less successful for Theresa May. Uh, she's really been seen as being humiliated by Europe, at least in terms of uh, the British press. Uh, can you fill us in? Do you believe that a deal is still possible for Theresa May? Absolutely. And I think uh, uh, most of the leaders uh, in their public statements have uh, attached a lot of hope uh, to the month of October and the negotiations that still need to be finalized uh, in order to meet the deadlines. The EU27 are united uh, between, uh, behind its uh, chief negotiator, uh, Michel Barnier. I think you could feel in Salzburg that both the, the United Kingdom as well as the EU27 understand that they have to move towards each other to meet the deadline. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us uh, would uh, do anything that's possible to avoid uh, a hard Brexit. Well, the UK government has clearly been looking for movement from the EU side, particularly on the issue of the future trade relationship and on the Irish border. Uh, it, it would clearly hurt the EU as well if the UK were to crash out with no deal. Um, there surely must be m room for movement. Where do you see room for movement on either of those issues? Well, as you know, uh, you, you rightly pointed out the two major still open issues. And uh, we understand that uh, Mr. Barnier uh, with his British uh, counterpart, uh, Secretary Raab, will be following up on the Salzburg meeting um, to take the negotiations forward. And uh, we all attach a lot of hope on those talks uh, in, in the month or during the month of uh, October. Mm -hmm. um, should uh, the negotiations be brought to a successful end, which we very much hope, then uh, there was also talk at Salzburg about the possibility of uh, a summit meeting sometime mid-November. Uh, well, indeed, uh, people are wondering if uh, a Brexit deal is possible within the agreed timetable, even if the actual departure of the UK from the EU itself might have to be pushed back. What's your opinion on that? Well, uh, at this stage, all of our energy will and should be going into the negotiations uh, in the month of October. Um, I think many member states express their regret on, on uh, the UK's decision to leave. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all of us are very interested in a strong relationship with the United Kingdom even after the Brexit. But at this very stage, I think all our energy should go in, into those talks. And uh, uh, we are optimistic that it is still possible to uh, arrive at a deal uh, by the end of October. And, uh, well, the other dominant theme in Salzburg was migration. Let's move on to that topic. Uh, the European Commission's proposed to beef up the Frontex border force to 10,000 guards by 2020. Hungary, though, one of the nations saying that that would threaten sovereignty. Do you share Hungary's opinion on that? You're right uh, that there is still an ongoing discussion, not so much on the, on the basic fact of strengthening Frontex uh, as a requirement to strengthen external borders. Uh, but on its uh, method of implementation. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's true, there are some member states uh, who are uh, very interested on the issue of sovereignty, and that still needs to be uh, taken care of. However, as you may have heard, the president of the commission yesterday at the end of the meeting uh, indicated that he was optimistic that a solution would be found at the latest by the end of uh, this year. Your mm -hmm. Chancellor, uh, Sebastian Kurz, is one of the, the main proponents of a partnership between the EU and Egypt. Uh, we can hear what he had to say in Salzburg about that. Egypt has proven that it can be efficient. Since 2016, it has prevented ships leaving Egypt for Europe. Or when they did leave, 
It's taken them back. Egypt is now ready to deepen our cooperation. I believe this is an important step in the fight against illegal migration, but above all, in the fight against human trafficking as well. So, Mr. Lansky, Tiefenthal, are people wondering what kind of cooperation this might actually mean? Uh, having migrant processing centres for the EU, but based on Egyptian soil? All 28 member states agreed that should um, illegal migrants uh, be picked up in the Mediterranean or saved from the Mediterranean, which is one of the objectives, they should be brought to North African shores. Uh, and Salzburg brought progress on this question to the extent that all member states agreed uh, to a closer cooperation with North African countries. And as the Chancellor just indicated, uh, one first country with whom he and the President of the Council, Donald Tusk, recently met, uh, Egypt, uh, is willing to enter uh, discussions about formalities on how to do that. Egypt uh, is a successful model, as uh, the Chancellor indicated, since 2016. No ship with illegal migrants left from Egyptian shores. Mm -hmm. um, Egypt has found a way of looking after uh, migrants in Egypt jointly with uh, the UNHCR, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the International Organization of Migration. Uh, and that, based on that experience, uh, talks will continue now with Egypt. Well, just uh, looking at the conditions that might be facing migrants if that were to happen, uh, Catherine Woolard, who's the head of the European Council on Refugees and Exiles, said earlier this year migrant centres uh, could become permanent detention hubs. Uh, there are worries about smuggling, about trafficking groups. Essentially, within the EU, European laws and rights are protected, but the EU can't guarantee those rights and laws will be respected and protected outside of its territory, can it? Well, there are two points uh, to that question. One, Egypt does go a different way. There are no refugee or migrant centers in Egypt. Uh, refugees, or in that case migrants, uh, illegal migrants, uh, are being taken care of decentrally and looked after by the UNHCR, by the United Nations, as well as uh, IOM. Uh, and therefore, uh, these two uh, internationally renowned and recognized organizations ensure a certain level of uh, uh, quality of mm -hmm. treatment uh, for these migrants. All right, well, let's uh, look closer to home within Austria. We know that in 2015, Austria was uh, one of the countries with the highest number of asylum seeker arrivals uh, proportionately to the population, really putting pressure on Austria. Now, three years on, those arrival numbers are down. Our reporters, Vienne Laurent and Anthony Mills, have been finding out about what the situation looks like today. We can watch their report. Spielfeld, a transit point between Austria and Slovenia. This summer, 500 police officers and 200 soldiers simulated a border protection operation here. The goal? To show Austria is prepared to repel any new wave of migrants on the scale of 2015, when tens of thousands crossed the border. Now, the flow has thinned, but the border controls continue. Here in Spielfeld, the number of illegal immigrants we arrest has dropped significantly. But we still find some hiding in trucks and other vehicles. About 10 people a month, not much more. Despite EU criticism, Austria wants to prolong the border controls. Not useful, say migrant help NGOs. They suggest focusing on the 115,000 refugees and 46,000 asylum seekers already living in Austria. Actually, if we look at the government's actions, we can clearly see that they're not interested in integrating people. On the contrary, they're pressuring those people to leave our country. 27-year-old Ziagol fled Afghanistan in 2015 with her husband. Awaiting refugee status, she's taking classes offered by the Red Cross. Speaking German is crucial to finding a job. I'd really like to work in a nursery or maybe a shop. We hope to be able to stay and then I'd like to work, be happy and healthy, that's all. And maybe later have a child.
The government plans to tie German language skills to minimum income for those without resources. If refugees don't pass the European classification level B1, they could lose 300 euros a month, reducing the amount they have to live off to a monthly 563 euros. Accused by the opposition of instrumentalizing migration, the ÖVP, headed by Austria's Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, is pushing back and pushing forward its restrictive immigration policies. You should not close your eyes uh, when you feel that Austrian citizens have the feeling uh, we cannot integrate all the people who are arriving here. We don't uh, want to have a situation as we had in 2015, which uh, was the opposite of a strong uh, government uh, protecting our border, having everything under control. The UN High Commission for Human Rights, though, is concerned at the situation in Austria. It's sending a team to investigate whether or not migrants are being sufficiently protected here. All right, so coming back to Peter Lansky Tiefenthal, um, I'd just like to talk first about the extra border security that we've seen in that report in Austria. Uh, Austria is a member of the Schengen zone, which is meant to guarantee no border fences and controls. Uh, is Austria committed to staying within Schengen? Well, I think it's important to recall uh, that the effort of the EU28 is to strengthen external borders. Only if we, mention, uh, if we manage to strengthen external borders will we be able to retain open borders within the European uh, Union. And that's the approach that all 28 are taking, and that's why the Salzburg meeting focused, among others, uh, on steps towards strengthening those So are you waiting borders. for advances on the external border issue before you uh, pull back on border fences around Austria? Well, quite honestly, uh, if you look at uh, borders at other EU member states, uh, controls uh, are, in, uh, are on uh, the agenda of, of those member states for the exact same reasons to prevent a loss of control over illegal flows of migration. Now, we're uh, sticking with the borders. Uh, as the guard we heard in that report said, it, it, in case of an influx like 2015, that's uh, part of the reason for having these exercises we saw there. But the numbers of people coming into the EU have dropped by at least 80% since 2015. Is this perhaps a bit more of a public relations uh, exercise at this point? No, it's not at all a public relations exercise. You're right, the numbers are down, but at the same time, uh, we need to be prepared, and that's not just true for Austria, it's true for all the member states that are affected, as you pointed out in your program. Austria took in, only next to Sweden, the second largest number of uh, migrants in the years 2015 and 16, and is undertaking major efforts to integrate those that have been granted a positive asylum decision uh, through, as was also indicated, the German courses, because we strongly believe that the German language is an integral part of successful integration. And we also try to share with uh, uh, those who've been granted asylum the way of life of, mm -hmm. of Europe. Uh, for example, the respect for the role of women in society. It's interesting you mentioned the German language classes there, because there does, at the very least, seem to be a difference in perception on what your government's uh, policy is on terms of, in terms of integration. Um, you know, the federal government no longer funds these German language classes for foreigners, for example, in the city of Vienna. The city now has to fund those and has halved the number of places it makes available. Uh, we heard Erich Finninger from Volkshilfe in our report saying the government wants to pressure people to leave Austria. Um, that's quite an accusation. He's essentially saying you'd be happier if these people left? Well, first of all, it's important uh, to recall that there is a, an independent judiciary uh, in Austria, like in any uh, European country, uh, that is looking at each and every single asylum application case and is arriving uh, at its conclusions. And obviously, the government, respecting the judicial system and its decision, acts upon those who've been granted asylum and who then would have a legal basis to stay in Austria. And mm. for them, those programs, including the one on uh, the German language, 
are not just retained. In fact, uh, very recently, the government has increased its funding for those German language classes. All right, let's move on to um, broader issues in the EU then. Uh, just over a week ago, the European Parliament took the unprecedented step of voting in favour of Article 7 proceedings that are being brought against your neighbour Hungary for alleged degradation of rule of law, the judiciary, fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, now, the final decision on whether to impose sanctions on Mr Orban's government does rest at EU Council level. Um, but just to remind our viewers, the Council isn't obliged to move on this particularly. And now, um, Austria currently holds the presidency of the EU. Is Article 7 proceedings against Hungary going to be put on the Council's agenda during Austria's presidency? The uh, decision by the Parliament does not mean a conviction of Hungary at all. On the contrary, it sort of lays the basis to look at certain aspects uh, uh, in Hungary. Um, you know that uh, the, the schedule for the different Council meetings between now and the end of the presidency at the end of the year normally are set very early on uh, in the presidency. Uh, so at this stage cannot be said uh, whether it's going to be put on the agenda mm -hmm. uh, before the end of the year or not. OK, well, Peter Lansky, Tiefenthal, that is all we've got time for. Thank you very much for being with us here on Talking Europe. And thanks very much to our viewers for watching the programme as well. And we'll see you again very soon. Idi Amin Dada, Uganda's despotic leader, presided over his country in the 70s. He is remembered in very different ways. Some recall the hundreds of thousands who were killed and tortured. However, those who were born after that horrific era laud his lesser-known accomplishments. For them, he was as a builder, a nationalist and a separatist, the leader of time in Uganda's history, which they regard as a bygone golden era. We revisit the Kampala of Idi Amin Dada here on France 24.